Beautiful way to begin our morning. Why don't we begin our worship by standing and facing the font where we first meet Christ and it is where we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Loving God, we confess that we have turned from your way to follow our own ways. Forgive us for the times we have spoken or acted too quickly, for the times we have not spoken or acted at all, for moments when we have hurt those closest to us and those we have hurt that we have yet to know, for the ways we have thought more about ourselves than others and the ways that we have thought less of ourselves than we ought. Turn us around and give us a fresh start so that we can live again, children. Amen. Friends, even when we have done wrong, God makes us right. Even when we have messed up, God puts us back together. God's love never runs out. God's love never tires of calling us to be his beloved children. Hear God say to you now, your sins are forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And our opening hymn is on the screens this morning.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit that we may follow after your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament lesson is from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The word of the Lord. The responsorial psalm is Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all say, Glory. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. The New Testament lesson is from Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, this is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism for the repentance of the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. 
He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. This is probably one of the most familiar story beginnings in the entire world. In fact, Sharon probably could have just started the story without telling us where it was from, and you all could have said, Genesis 1. Probably 100% of you would have gotten that right. Most people know that. This is the creation story. But what most people don't know is that this story is presented to us not because the people of Israel hearing these words for the first time or sharing them orally in their tradition at that time had some kind of burning desire to lock us into some literal meaning that puts us on the opposite side of scientific discovery. No, nah, that's been a 20th century perversion of this. I mean, think about it. These words are written around 700 or 500 BC at a time when the Jewish people are exiled from their homeland. Jerusalem and all the major cities had been destroyed by Babylon and then the Assyrians. And after being dominated by those groups, the Persians came and enslaved them further. Their land was gone, their possessions were gone, homes destroyed, families were separated and scattered. Their every single day is sheer chaos. And what's more, everywhere they turn, the lands that they have been stolen off to presents a different God for them to worship. A sun God, a God of fertility, one for rain, one for harvest, a God of the oceans. So I ask you, in that circumstance, with their lives shattered and in chaos, do we really think that what they cared about most and needed a scripture written about most was how many days did it take God to create the earth? <laughs> no. No, because no one cares about that kind of stuff when lives are crumbling around us. What they really want to know in those moments is after all that this has happened to us, all, after all that we have lost, and after all that we are suffering through, after all the chaos that our lives now are, do we still believe that God, that our God, is strong enough to protect us and bless us? Is God still strong enough to protect us and bless us? Can he bring order and peace to what in our every single day is chaos and looks like it's just falling apart over and over and over again? And for that answer, they turn to what they've always turned to. To know what God will do with them, for them in the future they remember what God has done for them in the past. They remember, they remember that in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth, just like their own lives, was a formless void and darkness covered not just their lives, but the face of the deep. They remember that in the beginning, 
was chaos too. The Hebrews called it tohu wabohu. It was darkness and there was no form. And God brought light into that darkness. Let there be light. God gave form. He put a, a dome. Oh, the, the Hebrew word uh, for dome or vault or firmament, whatever the translation. The Hebrew word is rakia. It means literally that God blew a bubble. I love that. He blew a big bubble right into the middle of that chaos. And into that bubble is where he put his very orderly, and he did it methodically and very lovingly. He placed his creation in those that he loved. We read this story also very differently today than they would have read it back then. We've, we've read it just as kind of a narrative story, but actually the way the Hebrews would have read it is they would have broken it out responsively or liturgically. It would have gone back and forth between a narrator and a congregation. And so if I had been the narrator, I would have said, in the beginning when God created the world, there was tohu wabohu and there was darkness that covered the face of the deep. And then all of you would have responded, let there be light, God said. And they would do that back and forth throughout this entire seven-day story. And, you know, later on, they would say something like, I don't know, pick one. God created sun, moon, and stars. And the congregation would say, and it was good. And that would be how they remembered what God had done in the past. It would be how they remembered what God had done in the past so that they understood or remembered or believed or trusted what God would do for them now or in the future into their lives which need less chaos where they needed God to blow a bubble into their world to hold back the things that scared them most. This story is how they answered the question, do we still believe that God is strong enough to protect us and bless us in the middle of what seems like it's falling apart in our world of chaos? And I got to tell you, if this had been any other week in our nation, I would have told you that little story. I would have told you this and then shared maybe some contemporary story to emphasize the point, to help you keep it in your brain as you leave today. And then I would have tied it in the baptism, since today is the feast of Jesus' baptism. And then I would have sat down after saying, Amen. But this was not like any other week in our nation. Because you want to talk about tohu wabohu? You want to talk about darkness and chaos? That is what we saw. It is what we lived through and experienced on Wednesday. Our, uh, our bishop, as many of you know, has been a friend of mine for a long time. And I was on the phone with him um, on Wednesday when that insurrection occurred. He was actually downtown in Washington, D.C. as a counter-protester that day. He was down with other clergy, the, uh, along with the bishop of the D.C. Metro Synod. And what they did was they set up themselves on the lawn out front of Luther Place Memorial Church. And they stood there, and their protest was simply to pray and to sing hymns together praying for the healing and the peace and the reconciliation for, as he put it, our sin-sick world. And he and Bishop Ortiz and others watched as people of every walk and every political persuasion streamed up the street with banners and signs, not united, he said, by any one political message, but what felt like a single witness, that we are free, Each person was free that day to speak their own individual truths. 
Bishop Bill, he, um, he shared with me that as they stood in the circle and as people streamed by with different speeds and different senses of urgency, some stopped and prayed alongside them. And in that moment, he was sharing with me, it felt like they were community. Whether they agreed or disagreed, they weren't bound together by any political party, but they were bound by Jesus Christ the healer, the reconciler, the merciful broker of justice, the one who brings light. He is the light of the world, who brings light into darkness and order to chaos. This was interesting. Bill said to me, it was intensely political what they were doing, but it wasn't partisan because they weren't praying to the God of the Republicans or the God of the Democrats or the God of the Libertarians. They were praying to Jesus, the Lord of all. But then he shared with me that even though there were times when people stopped to pray, there were others who stopped to yell at them and to spit at them he said the most grotesque display was by three men who actually rushed their gathering. One of them wore a t-shirt with an image of George Floyd and it said George Floyd and then the N-word. And he was wearing like this animal skin as well, this guy was. And this guy fell down at our bishop's feet. The second guy who was there with them kneeled on his neck laughing at them and the third snapped a picture. And then Bill told me that the three of them ran across the street to the National Christian Church and did it again. The bishop called it evil, an attempt to turn their peaceful gathering into something evil. But it was more than that, he said. He was standing there, and he said he could just feel the racism thick and how it demeaned the image of God in all of us. You know, our story today, our Genesis story goes on to say, he created us all in the image of God. <laughs> One of the central themes, not just of ordering chaos in creation, but just in the Christmas season, we just finished. Demeaning the image of God. As he left, that was when he, he called me. And all of us on TV saw the overrunning of the Capitol building. And uh, again, none of it was partisan. It was evil. And it was evil because our Old Testament lesson is absolutely right. The people of Israel were right. The darkness and the chaos is real. It is real as is the sinfulness shielded by the shadows and the confusion that that brings. The confusion and fear and division, the division in our country, the losses of life both on Wednesday and throughout this year are real. And the politics of both sides don't change that. The reality of the world we are currently living in is that chaos, confusion, and emptiness are way closer than we would like. And we are tired of holding that back, of managing, of fighting the chaos. I mean, do you feel that too? I'm exhausted that you fight against the chaos, the chaos of our country today, the chaos of COVID-19, of the illness of, in our own lives, aging loved ones, or the chaos of brokenness within our families or relationships with others, or of struggling to pay bills or losing people that we love too soon, or the chaos of life just handing us way too much. The people of Israel in the chaos of exile wrote these words of Genesis for us today. 
They prayed this. And they did it together. Whenever their community could get together, or with their families in their homes, they recounted the stories of what God had done in the past, and they waited and they hoped, day after day after day, waiting for what God would do for them in the future. Hoping, if you will, for like that seventh day, which I didn't include in our reading today, because on that seventh day, God rested. And in fact, all of creation rested and was at peace because of what God had done. Peace from what God had done. This he did not only in creation, he did it not only in restoring exile, which was, or restoring exiled Israel back home, but he also did it in the baptism of Jesus' death on the cross. He did it in our own baptism, you and mine as we were baptized, into Jesus' death in which God lays siege not to government buildings, but lays siege to you and to me to our hearts and to our lives, not by force, not by clinging to power, but by giving his life on a cross and in our baptism, baptism, baptizing us into a life where our lives are lived to show the same kind of self-giving love to everyone else in the world. Later on that night, on Wednesday night, I was watching the sermon that Bill had preached because ironically, November or January 6th was not just the day of the insurrection. It was the day of the epiphany of our Lord. The Christmas season had ended. It was epiphany day. And Bill led a service that night and he urged his hearers in that sermon that maybe now, is the time as the baptized for us to proclaim light, for all of us to proclaim God's light into the midst of the chaos and the darkness of this world, to recommit ourselves to love one another, especially to love those that we find it hardest to love. And to love them not simply in our words, but in our deeds. to be partners with God in bringing order to what is chaos. For the sake of this world that God still loves so much that he sent his son. Amen. Friends, why don't we stand and sing together?
Friends, every year at this time, on this festival, we always do a, a, a remembrance of our own baptism a piece to our service, um, where you know we have a little bit of a litany, and then we invite people to go back to the font and retrieve one of our watery stones that are back there. Uh, a lot of our members have uh, the vases that you see on the table that are back by the font, and each year they add one of those stones, and so it begins to look like water kind of filling up that vase, kind of a remembrance uh, that you get to keep in your home every day when you look at it a remembrance of our baptism. So um, as you leave today, I'm going to invite you to take one of the stones uh, that we've laid out, because normally we put them in the water, but probably figured this year not good for us all to be reaching into the water at the same time as to get that out. Um, and so we have retrieved them uh, uh, earlier this week, cleaned them all up. They're on this uh, table for you to take. Um, if you are new to our congregation or visiting today and you'd like to take one of the vases, you may do so um, and take a stone as well. That way, as you come back year after year when we do this, uh, you can continue to kind of add to that collection and add to that remembrance. Um, so as it is, we have a remembrance now that we'll go through and you can grab your stone at the end of our service. Dear friends, we give thanks to God for the gift of baptism as we present ourselves before God this day to affirm our baptism in the Christ. When we were joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we were clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Thanks be to God for his gift of grace. Blessed are you, O God of grace. From age to age, you made water a sign of your presence among us. In the beginning, your spirit brooded over the waters and you created the world by your word, calling forth life in which you took delight. You led Israel safely through the Red Sea into the land of promise. And in the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed Jesus to be your beloved one. By water and the Spirit, you adopted us as your daughters and sons, making us heirs of the promise and servants of God. Through this water, remind us of our baptism. Shower us with your Spirit that your forgiveness, grace, and love may be renewed in our lives. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you that you have made us your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called us to yourself, enlightened us with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished us in the community of faith. Uphold all of us, your servants, as we affirm the gifts and promises of baptism and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to this new birth through this holy sacrament. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, with the whole church, let us confess our faith together. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you, do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the light everlasting. Amen. Friends, you have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue to live in the covenant God made with you in your holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and to share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Jesus Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. So, friends, let us pray. We give thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give us a new birth. Wash us from sin and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in each one of us the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world and its leaders, that guided by the Holy Spirit, they proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Lord, in your mercy. 
for wilderness and water, wind and wild beasts, and all living things on earth that God's goodness is revealed through creation and faithful stewards care for all God has made. Lord, in your mercy. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for laborers busy both day and night, and for peacemakers amid strife, that God inspire all people to use their strength wisely. Lord, in your mercy. For the sick and those who provide medical care, for the imprisoned and those who show them mercy, for the lonely and those who provide companionship, for all who suffer. Today, we pray for especially Ron Henry, Russ Hokinson, Charlie Young, Danny Mason, Judy Parsons, Sherry Thompson, Dana Hauser, John and Barb Williams, Dave Frampton, Ruth Bowles, Kelly Croft, Joe and Lynn Pauser, Lois Hardy, Marge Davis, Nelson and Diane Murray, John Newcomer Sr., Del Lenker, Colby Sturkin family, Carol Ruckel, Kevin Meinholt, Chris and Barb Hewlett, Hilde Crothers, Lamont and Sharon Smith, Stephen Benzcoder and family, Richard Pierce, Bill Cox, Ron Norvell, Inga Keith and family, and the family of Lenore Hoffman, that God shower compassion on them. Lord, in your mercy. For the congregation gathered here, for students returning to school, for those seeking renewal in their daily work, that all the beloved of God experience grace and peace. Lord, in your mercy. At this time, everyone is invited to offer your own prayers, either aloud or in your hearts. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their, from their labors, that their witness inspire us in our baptism, baptismal vocations. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace with those around you, either by a, a peace sign or an elbow bump or whatever folks are uh, comfortable doing. And for those of you worshiping with us at home, uh, may our peace go with you as well. Well, friends, good morning. Welcome to St. Philip's Lutheran Church, where our mission is to make disciples, praise God, and serve the community. Um, I want to especially welcome Diane Gray today, who is uh, back with us again, sitting in for John, who is, uh, I'm sorry, for Stephen, who's on vacation. Sorry, guys at home. Um, sitting in for Stephen, who's on vacation. Uh, everybody's on vacation this week. Uh, it's like you and me are left. <laughs> Um, Pastor John is also on vacation. Both Stephen and uh, John will be back and around tomorrow again. Uh, but they uh, just took a Sunday off because, hey, in COVID, you just try to find the time you can, right? Not that you go anywhere. You just find time to rest. A um, couple of things just to lift up. Uh, because John is coming back, uh, that means that owls will be meeting. That's the older, wiser Lutheran seniors. will be meeting by Zoom at 1130 on Tuesday. Pastor John has a presentation that on that day. Uh, I believe he sent out a sign-up genius. If not, uh, call him tomorrow morning and uh, he can get you signed up and everything. Uh, because John is on vacation, we also discovered that the program that was going to start today, which was going to have one of us running technology and the other teaching, becomes fairly impossible when one of us isn't here. Um, so we discovered that about midweek as I'm preparing the lesson going, hey, wait a minute, who's running this? Um, so we're actually, we kicked it back a week, which was fine anyway, because we had an extra Sunday tucked in there for one of our Together in Faith gatherings, which during COVID, we haven't been doing either because sharing food and a lot of close contact wasn't a smart uh, thing. So we had a, a week to kind of uh, flex into anyway. So that large group session will start next week. There is a sign-up genius for that. Um, the topic uh, of it is how Luther's catechism speaks to us into this time. Um, and so uh, there's details uh, in the email that we send out every week that you can uh, get on that class. 
A couple of pieces of business out in the narthex uh, for our members are your financial statements for 2020. Uh, you'll, need to, you'll need them for your taxes, I'm sure. Uh, anything that's left here after uh, January 31st, we will mail out. Um, so if you don't get it this week or next week or the following, we'll be mailing out. So please try to pick them all up. And for those of you who are at home, we will just mail yours out. We're not going to do a whole, um, you know, come by and pick it up thing, unless you want to come by and pick it up. But otherwise, we're going to mail it out. Uh, and then the other piece of business is that our congregational meeting is on January 24th. Um, and that's at 1130 um, so that's after the second service. So for those of you who are at the second service at that time, um, you can just stay in your seat. For those of you who come to the early service or who are worshiping at home these days, it will be live streamed as well. And you'll be able to ask questions and everything uh, through the live stream. So uh, we'll send out a link to that for those who are live streaming closer to the date because we know if we send it out too early, you won't know where it is anyway by the time we get there. So uh, that's been our experience. Uh, so with that, let's get back to worship. Normally we'd be receiving our gifts and offerings right now, but the offering plate, rather than being passed around, is right back there by the font. So just drop it on in there or continue doing the wonderful things that you're doing to mail them in and give online and everything. And uh, thank you so much for that. So we'll continue with our offertory prayer now. So please stand. And let us pray together. Merciful God, receive the gifts we bring, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Through this meal, unite us as your body, shining with the light of your justice and mercy. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, Christ lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Lord, you fill our world with glory and light, and yet our mortal eyes cannot behold so bright a truth. Therefore, in time, you sent to us Jesus Christ, your truth made flesh. He lived among us, teaching, healing, and revealing the boundless riches of your grace, that everyone might see and know the power of your love for us. And that is why, in the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering the life and work of Christ, his ministry among the poor and lost, his death upon the cross of human shame, and the victory revealed by the empty tomb, we offer you our lives in thanksgiving and peace, in unity with Christ, our friend and Lord. Send your Holy Spirit upon us here and on these gifts of bread and wine that we share. Make us gathered here in love for you, members of the, holy, of the body of our Lord, that we may share the promise of the gospel, one with Christ and one in the ministry to all the world. 
through Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Joined together by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Friends, we who are many are one body. Come, be filled with light and life. Thanks be to God. Just a quick reminder how we will be doing communion today. Do I have my thing on? I do have it on. Uh, how we'll be doing communion today. Um, you'll be coming forward. There's three aisles. You'll be coming up and returning by whatever aisle you are sitting on. That way we don't kind of cut through aisles uh, and whatnot. We kind of keep a good distance from folks. Uh, if you're on this side, you'll be coming up to me. If you're on that side, you'll come up to Sharon. Uh, we'll offer you the communion. It's a little prepackaged uh, communion. And just remember, um, you're peeling off the cellophane first to get the bread and then the foil second to get the wine. And uh, it, don't worry if you have trouble with that. People often do. But then you can deposit your empty containers in the baskets that are in front of each one of the aisles and then return to your seat by the aisle that you came up. And all are welcome, so I do hope you come. Thank you. 
And friends, let us pray. O morning star, fair and bright, you have refreshed us again with heavenly food. Go with us now, today, tomorrow, every day, that we may tell the story of your never-ending love and sing your praise both now and forever. Amen. And now, may the glory of God dwell in you richly, name you beloved, and shine brightly on your path. And may the blessing of Almighty God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to pick up your financial statements and your watery stone on your way out. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.
Thank mm-hmm. you.